Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Brain and the team, and thank you all for being here. It's good to see you. Um, I bring you greetings from Mokopane. I was preaching there this morning, um, and they just sent their love and regards. We had a good time there, and uh, we pray for more continued uh, fellowship there. Um, for this evening, before we get into prayer, I'd just like you to turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2 as we seek to explore the theme of meaning in life or the meaning of life. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. In the interest of time, I'll not necessarily do a thorough exposition of the passage. I'll just highlight a few key things. But before that, I'll just like to read the entirety of it so that we get a gist of um, what the passage is about. So I'll read through the passage, I'll pray, and then we will explore the meaning of life in this chapter. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 2 from verse 1, and I will read. I say to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself, and behold, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it is madness. And of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was, gui was guiding me wisely. And how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself, from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had, um, had home-born slaves. Also, I possessed flocks and herds, larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold, and the treasure of kings and provinces, I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased, more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Thus. I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was no profit under the sun. So I, I turned to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will the man do who will come after the king except what has already been done? And I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet, I know that one fate befalls them both. Then I say to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I say to myself, this too is vanity, for there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool. Inasmuch as in the coming days all will be forgotten, and how the wise man and the fool alike die. So I hated life, for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after wind. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor, for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor, for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Therefore, I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor, for which I had labored under the sun. When there is a man, when there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them. This too is vanity and a great evil. For what does a man get in all his labor and in his striving with which he labors under the sun? Because 
all this, because all his days, his task is painful and grievous. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? For to a person who is good in his sight, he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. While to the sinner, he has given the task of gathering and collecting so that he may give to one who is good in God's sight. This too is vanity and striving after wind. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are grateful for life. You, as our creator, found it fit not only to create us, but to reveal to us the very purpose of life. And we pray that as we explore the meaning of life, the reason for which we exist, we pray that you will use your wise words here to enlighten us and to bring us to an understanding, to remind us of this great wisdom and knowledge in terms of finding purpose, finding meaning in life only in you. And that truly, as far as our lives here on earth are concerned, they will not be vain. It will not be vanity because we would have found you and in that found true meaning of life and in life. And for that, we do pray that, O oh Lord, you will continue to enlighten us and remind us of you and what you expect of us as far as life is concerned. We pray all this believing and trusting in your name. Amen. So the quest to find meaning in life. In Ecclesiastes, this is exactly what we find. A man on a quest to find meaning in life. So this book should be of interest to us. Why? Because we are just like this man, right? We are also on a quest to find meaning in life. There's no one who doesn't want to discover this. Once you find yourself here, you want to know why, right? That's why we see that immediately after God creates Adam, he knows that this would be the next question or a series of questions, right? Why am I here? Who created me? And for what? Where am I going? And where will I return to, right? What is the meaning of all this? Why did I suddenly appear? And so to answer the meaning of life, God appears to man immediately and reveals to him the reason for which he is alive. You see, for Adam, God appeared to him in the garden to answer the question of the meaning of life. And for us, once again, God appears to us in Ecclesiastes through the wise words of Solomon to answer this very question. You see, this is how you need to understand Ecclesiastes. It's a philosopher. But then as a philosopher, you see, you can be exploring a subject or exploring a people group. And when you do that, you stand objectively on the outside as a researcher looking at someone or a people group and analyzing their life. And the problem with, with that is that you may look at that person and draw conclusions that are not actually based on fact. Because, for example, if you look at Solomon, you would see someone who's very wealthy, who's very wise, who has it all figured out in life, and you'd think, Lord, if I can only be like that man, then I would truly have found meaning in life and be fulfilled and satisfied. But Solomon is here sitting as a philosopher and saying, don't look objectively on the outside because you may be fooled as to what the true meaning of life is when you look at me. So he sits as a philosopher and says, I will reflect on my own experience because I don't want you to draw conclusions that are not factual so that I may tell you from my own experience what you should actually see because you would be seeing the wrong thing. And that is what we do every day, right? When you look at the next person, what do we always say? The grass is always greener on the other side. This is Solomon coming to us and saying, there's no such thing. And truly, Solomon is a perfect candidate for this because there's no one who explored the extent of life more than Solomon. In extent of wealth, wisdom, in extent of the works that he did, no one matches him. So he sits and he says, you know what? Just before you falsely conclude that this is the essence of life, let me speak to you from my own experience 
because he knows truly, especially as a wise man speaking to the young people, that this is the temptation, that one would look at him and think that that is the essence of life and that he is living it to the full extent, yet that is not the case. It is important, therefore, to listen to such a man as Solomon. You see, if someone who is poor comes to you and tells you, well, you do not need to be wealthy, it is not the essence of life, it is easy for you to say, of course you would say that, you are a poor man, after all, you need to console yourself. But if the richest man ever on earth came and said, you know what, that is not the essence of life, then you need to listen. So this is the perfect candidate. He's the perfect philosopher to bring to us the essence of life because he knows what it means to live and experience pleasure to the fullest and is also reflecting on his own experience. He speaks for himself. No one speaks for him. Something important to consider as far as exploring the true philosophy and the true meaning of life is that we also need to go back to the beginning. Because in the beginning, we do find a particular philosophy introduced to man. You see, the devil is introduced to us in the Bible as someone who wears many hats, but the very first one that he wore when he walked the earth, when he entered onto the scene and is, um, and is interacting with Adam, is the heart of a philosopher. It's the heart of a philosopher. Because man had been given the essence of life and what it means, and the devil came in and said, well, is it really so? Isn't life something else other than what God had revealed to you? And so he came in and corrupted the hearts and minds of mankind, and since then, man has been grappling with this question. What is the essence of life? The confusion started in the garden when the devil sold the man, the man the idea that, you know what, there is something you need to know about life. What God has revealed to you isn't the essence of life. Because as far as life is concerned, there is a way in which you can live without limitation. The devil comes to man and says, you need to consider something. Engage me in a philosophical debate. What did God say? Well, in as far as he said that, he limited you. But there is a different way of finding greater meaning in life, breaking the limitations of God, and thereby exploring life to the fullest extent. And that is the essence of man today, isn't it? I need to live life to the full. The sky is the limit, or rather, beyond the sky. There are no limitations. And everyone is grappling with this idea of, I need to maximize my potential. I need to do the most that I can so that I can be this great person that everyone can look at and say, there goes a man or a woman who maximizes his or her potential. A life without limits. And so the devil tells man, you do not understand. God has put limitations on you. And the idea behind the limitations is that there's something that he doesn't want you to know. There's a potential that he doesn't want you to realize. And if only you eat of the forbidden fruit, then you would realize this potential. On the other side of that philosophical debate, Solomon comes to us and reveals to us that it is not so. Because I have pursued life to its fullest extent, there is no one who has lived the extent to which I have in Jerusalem, and surely no one after me, and you need to listen to me. There is a way that man needs to live life, and there is a way that, brings, that man's life brings glory to God, and the only way is to return to the limitations that God had placed upon man. Because the fullest extent, breaking from the boundaries of God, led man to nothing but sin. In the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. In the day that you break the limitations that I have placed upon you, you will die. 
And so Solomon here is simply calling us back to the boundaries within which God had set, that we may find the true meaning of life and thereby live accordingly. First of all, in the first 11 verses, this is what we see. As far as Solomon is concerned, the pursuit of wealth. And before we consider a few verses there, you also need to consider the experience of Adam because we need to contrast Solomon with Adam. You find that Adam had what you may call a perfect experience in as far as wealth is concerned. He was in the Garden of Eden, the Garden in Eden, the so-called paradise of God. He could eat of any fruit of any tree, except obviously the forbidden fruit. The land was filled with all kinds of uh, precious metals and, and material wealth as well. And something to consider is that he also had access to the tree of life. A tree within which if he ate, he would live forever. So he knew what it meant to be truly wealthy. And he had experiences, obviously, um, that were also uh, before sin, in a perfect state. He did not encounter some of the sinful states earlier on that we do even today. But you see, the experience of the king is different. I intentionally contrast Solomon and Adam because if there was any person who was greater than Solomon, then it must be logically Adam because he had the experience of life outside of sin, before sin. And so he would have known the extent of life in a more perfect and fuller sense. And so it is important to look and contrast between these two because they are what the, the two individuals that come closest to maximizing their full potential as far as the Bible is concerned. With Adam, we see a perfect state. The garden in Eden, great wealth, access to the tree of life, and he could eat of any tree except the forbidden tree. But we see with Solomon, as far as his experience of wealth, it is different. Even though he pursued and had wealth to the fullest extent ever known to man, he did not experience any joy. In the interest of time, I'll just highlight a few verses here. In verse 4, he begins to say, I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. And I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves. And I had home-born slaves. Also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. The idea is that he was incomparable to anyone who had lived before him. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the measure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers, and it goes on and on. Then I became, verse 9, great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Solomon here is simply stating that if there was any man who had ever come close to what Adam has experienced as far as wealth is concerned, then it was me. But look at verse 11. Thus, I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor for which I had exerted. And behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was no profit under the sun. He is saying, I had acquired all there is, or all there was to acquire as far as wealth is concerned. You name it. But my experience wasn't as pleasant. It was all vanity when it comes to wealth. So then he turns to wisdom, secondly, from verses 12 to 17. He says, so I turned to consider wisdom in verse 12. And again, you contrast him with Adam, right? If you consider Adam, he was probably the wisest man to have ever lived. I say this for this reason. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, there's something interesting. As God is going through the six days of creation, you see him also naming elements of creation. But then once he creates Adam, the naming function seems to switch to him because then once Adam is on the scene, 
He names the animals. So a function that was for God, now he delegates to man. You need wisdom for that, right? And indeed, great wisdom. And then you see as well that when God is giving man dominion, he says rule over three spheres, right? The sky, the earth, and the sea as well. But what do we know of man? He's a natural being. He cannot fly, but he has dominion over the birds in the sky. He, there, he is not the strongest creature. There are animals, land animals, which are greater, stronger, and bigger than him, but he is to rule over them. He cannot live underwater, but he rules over the fish of the sea. How would he do this? Wisdom. Wisdom. God gave him wisdom. Ultimately, the greatest wisdom that God gives him, Genesis 2.17 do not eat of the forbidden tree, lest you die. What does that mean? I am giving you wisdom for life. I am giving you wisdom for life. The secret to live forever. The wisdom that has eluded all mankind till today. Think about it. In all the advancement that man has accomplished till today, no one has ever cracked the code of death. No one can say, I am so wise that I have discovered there secret to death. I am the one person who will not die. It is not true. It is not possible. All of us who are here today will die one day. But to Adam, was given the wisdom to life, to say, you know what, if you do this and don't do this, you will live. This was the wisest man truly who had ever lived. We contrast that with the experience of the king. Also a wise man, and as far as his wisdom is concerned, again, he considers it futile. His experience is not so pleasant. Why? Because he is limited by death. Look at verse 14. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness, and yet I know that one fate befalls them both. What is the one fate that befalls them both? Verse 16. For there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool. Inasmuch as in the coming days all will be forgotten, and how the wise man and the fool alike die. So he considers his wisdom and says, is it truly wisdom? If I'm not wise enough to stay alive, is it really truly wisdom? What is the point of all the accomplishments there is in, uh, on the, in this world if one day I will die? Because to be truly wise is to crack the code of death. Because then you're truly wise. Otherwise, it is futile. And that's why then, lastly, he turns to his labors. And he says, even my labors are futile. From verses 18 to 23. Why? Because one day I will die. And all that I've worked for, another person will enjoy. Verse 18. Thus I, I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Verse 21, when there is a man who has, who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them. This too is vanity and a great evil. So he looks at his wealth, it is vain. He looks at his wisdom, it is vain. He looks at his work as well. It is vain. Why? Because there is the equalizer in all these instances, which is death. We find that Adam's experience as, work, as far as work is concerned, it was pleasurable. Before sin, it was pleasurable, right? Multiply, fill the earth, rule the world. In Genesis 2.17, is given work to do, and it was pleasurable. But then this would change when man would fall. And so the experience of Solomon is not like that of Adam, whereby Adam will multiply, fill the world, share in, his, share in the labor, and in the blessings of creation, the blessings of that labor. But Solomon is saying, as far as I'm concerned, when I labor, it's not as if I share in the labor with someone else. There's just someone else waiting for me to die to enjoy it on my behalf. And I don't know. It will be a wise man, maybe, or maybe it will be a fool. So my labor is futile. Why? Because one day I will die. I will die. And the reason for this, the vanity that the 
king here, the man who explored life to extent, is revealing to us the reason for all this, vanity in his wealth, in his wisdom, and in his work, is simply because man chose to go beyond the boundaries that God had set. Man chose to go beyond the limitations of God because he was a limited natural being and the temptation that came to him, as I said in the beginning, was that there is more to you. You should just break the limitations within, with which God has given you and you will experience life to the fullest extent. And this is the irony. Instead of the limitations bringing joy and pleasure and full satisfaction, they brought something different. We see God limiting man as far as his wealth is concerned. Yes, he could enjoy of all of creation except what? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this was the temptation that the devil was bringing him. Yes, God has made you wise and said you should not eat this particular tree. And in, and in that, he has limited you from knowing evil. Yes, you are wise in terms of you know what it means uh, or what it takes to be alive, but you do not know what is evil. So you are wise, yes, but with limitation. And this is the temptation that came to him. It wasn't enough that he was wealthy and in the garden in Eden, he wanted the tree uh, with which um, he was forbidden. It wasn't enough that he was wise and had the code to, to stay alive. He wanted to know what it means to be. Uh, he wanted rather to have the knowledge of evil as well. And as far as his work is concerned, there were limitations as well. Because God tells him, you will rule over the world, yes, but only as a steward, not as someone who owns it. That's why even David com gives commentary in Psalm chapter 8 and said, you know what, God, I can see. You've made man a little lower than the angels. He doesn't have supernatural ability. You've given him spheres that are beyond his ability. He cannot fly in the sky. He cannot live in the water. So again, I give you work. I give you dominion, but with limitations. And so the devil comes to man and says, look, you are wealthy, right? But with limitations. You are wise, right? But there's something you do not know. You've been given work, you've been given a stewardship, but with limitations. You are not a supernatural being. And so the temptation comes to man that he can go beyond the boundaries and experience life to its fullest extent. But then the opposite happens. Because we see that his wealth begins to decay. It's not enhanced. Chapter 3 of Genesis, thorns and thistles shall the ground bear for your sake. The beauty of creation is mad, and he is even kicked out of the garden in Eden. His wealth began to decay, and it was taken away from him. Instead of him becoming wiser, his advanced wisdom convicts him of sin. Instead of becoming like God, he runs away from God instead. Genesis chapter 3. So his, his desire to enhance his wisdom only brought him the conviction that he's a sinner who needs to get as far away from God as possible. And what about his work? It began to strain him. By the sweat of your brow will you eat. Solomon tells us, I even work and someone else profits. And I don't know what he will do with it because he will not value my labor. It is an irony, isn't it? If you consider it, that man sought to break the limitations of God and sought to enhance his life and instead, what he found on the other side of breaking these limitations is what? Death. It's such an irony, right? I want to enhance life, but then instead I reap the fruit of death. I reap the fruit of death. I seek to find meaning in life beyond God's limitations. Thinking on the other side, I'll find great potential, pleasure, profit. Instead, you find death. And this is the lament of Solomon in this passage. In verse 3 of our passage, this is what he says. I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely. And how to take hold of folly until I could see 
what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. Do you see that? I, I want to see and explore the few years of my life that I have here, the extent to which I can maximize my potential. But then it concludes in verse 11 that all this is vain. It is futile in the end because man is limited. Even as far as his wisdom is concerned, we've read in verse 16 that am I truly wise if just as the fool I also die? Am I truly wise? What is the extent of my wisdom? Because eventually I will die. I have few days here on earth and I will die. And even as far as um, the last section is concerned is labor, we've read in verse 18 that he will leave his, the toil and all he had worked for to another person. Why? Because he's limited by death. He will not be here to enjoy the fruit of his labor all, uh, forever, perpetually, without dying. So death is a limiting factor. It's a limiting factor as far as wealth is concerned, as far as wisdom is concerned, as far as work is concerned. And this is a theme that the writer even explores more extensively in the book of Ecclesiastes, in many other passages, and in various ways. So in light of death, what then is the resolution? What does the wise man give us as a solution? Because he says, I have explored all this to the extent that you will never explore. I know what it means to be wealthy. I know what it means to be wise. I know what it means to work truly to the fullest extent. And in all that, it is vain because we are limited by death. We've strayed beyond the boundaries of God and we cannot find meaning. We cannot find satisfaction in anything that this life has to offer because it will not bring joy, it will not bring fulfillment, and ultimately, death is the equalizer to us all. So then, what is the resolution? As we continue to read in verses 24 and 25, Solomon gives us insight there. In verse 24, verses 24 and 25, this is what he says. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? You see, the writer is simply now refocusing all his energy, all his efforts, all his thoughts towards God. He's saying, I tried it on my own, and I explored everything to its fullest extent. But then, in all that, in all my experience, I've realized that I need to come back to within the boundaries of God. Because if I'm to find meaning in life, if I'm to find productivity in my labor, labor if I'm to eat and drink and even enjoy myself, that can only come from God. After all, isn't he the creator? Isn't he the one who came to Adam after he created him and told him, Adam, you do not need to worry about or ask yourself why you are here. I am the one who created you, and this is what I desire of you. And these are the limitations that are put upon you. And in finding ourselves within um, the boundaries, we find that there is contentment. There is contentment. And that's why, if you're keen to read this passage, it's not talking about extravagance, as far as verses 24 and 25 are concerned. He says there's nothing better for a man than to eat and drink. Than to eat and drink. Matthew chapter 6, the essence of life, right? What you'll eat, what you'll drink, what you'll wear, you do not have to worry about it. Why? Because God will provide. This is Matthew chapter 6. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. The little that I can work for, the little that I have, my labor, it's joyful and enjoyable to me. This also I've seen that it is from the hand of God because God is calling us to what? Contentment. The little that I have to eat and drink and the labor that I find myself doing, that is enough. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? It is impossible to enjoy your efforts outside of God because you will stray beyond the boundaries and in it you will only find misery. To bring ourselves back to the boundary of God, 
still within Matthew chapter 6, this is what the Bible reveals to us plainly. Because there are those who seek after the futility and the extent of um, wealth uh, and, and wisdom and work, but then there are those who seek something else. And this is what it means to be within the boundaries of God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, clearly says that we do not need to worry about what we will eat or drink or even wear because he knows our needs. And then from verses 31 to 33, this is what he reveals to us. 31, Matthew chapter 6. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. The Gentiles make this the end of their pursuit in life. The Gentiles seek all these things. The Gentiles seek after wealth, after wisdom, and work to the fullest extent in order to find meaning in them. But as we saw with Solomon, it is, shouldn't be so. So then what should we seek if we shouldn't seek after these things? Verse 33 reveals to us clearly. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The essence of life as we have it, as Solomon reveals to us, as the scriptures reveal to us, is to go back to the boundaries within which God had set for mankind. The essence for why we exist, to glorify him as natural beings glorifying the supernatural God. And that in our limitations, he finds great glory because in that he is glorified. And indeed, we've fallen short of this glory. And we are on this side of sin whereby we are limited by death. But in him, we find the, not only the meaning of life, but the solution to death. And that's why he say, says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Because there you find the meaning of life and the solution to death. And that is only possible through Christ our Lord. In the interest of time, we'll just stop there and break into prayer. And then Brin will also come and lead us in a song afterwards in the end. But let us pray before we break. Dear Lord, we come before you just exploring your word and considering the essence of life and why we are here and pray that you will help us maintain our lives within the boundaries that you have set. Because within these limitations we find that we do not have to grapple concerning what the essence of life is and concerning how we may find joy and satisfaction in life, because you have defined these boundaries for us, O oh Lord. And we pray that you'll help us not to stray, but to find great contentment in what you have for us as far as life is concerned, and that we would walk in your will and purpose, seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness. We pray all this believing and trusting in you. Amen. Amen. Okay.